evening to all of you present here. Uh, first of all, let me thank uh, Dr. Selvin for having given me the opportunity to uh, make my presentation today on Marcha Eliade's myth and reality. And I would be deemed ungrateful if I don't thank Dr. Noel Rudeiraj, a great teacher and a legend who suggested my name for this series. Many thanks to my colleagues at BIT Velour, some of who are here with me today, giving me the right support and encouragement. Thank you. You people really are angels. Thank you very much. And I thank the scholars who are here from my university to encourage me. And I thank all of you who have taken time off your work to listen to this lecture today on Marcha Eliade's myth and reality and overview. Now, there are a few things that I'd like to make very clear at the outset. Number one, I'm not going to summarize chapter by chapter Eliade's book on myth and reality. No. That would be pretty mundane and I don't think it's going to yield much results. My focus is to analyze myth and reality from the viewpoint of traditional myths what people call original myths Sir? and modern myths. Okay, so who was Mercha Eliade? Let's get the pronunciation right. He was a Romanian historian, religious historian, a mythographer, a critic, a fiction writer. We pronounce his name as Mercha Eliade. Mercha Eliade. This is how we pronounce his name. Now, the Britannica.com says he was one of the world's yeah, foremost yeah. interpreters of religious symbolism and myth. In fact, he's written quite a number of books, all related to shamanism, to the history of religion, to the return of uh, divinity, you know, the sacred and the profane. There are so many books that he's written. And all these books are related to myth and symbolism. So, in fact, most people don't know much about Marcha Eliade. Whenever we talk about myth, scholars talk about Carl Jung. Research scholars, I mean. Academicians mostly talk about Carl Jung, Carl Gustav Jung. Uh, in fact, people even talk about Freud and his approach to myth in relation to psychoanalysis. People mostly relate myth to Joseph Campbell. They say if, if it is myth, it has to be related only to Joseph Campbell. That is not the way myth is to be seen. In fact, most people don't even know anything about Marcha Eliade. So that is precisely why I decided to choose this particular book by Marcha Eliade, Myth and Reality. Now, let me just pass on to... <laughs> A particular statement about Marcha Eliade. He is generally considered a very controversial writer. You know why? Because number one, he favors Hinduism. He favors Asian religions, particularly Hinduism. In fact, if you read Marcha Eliade's Myth and Reality, you will find that there is a lot of reference to Hinduism. There is a lot of information about which we are not aware as Indians. As Hindus, as Indians, we are not aware of most of the information that he presents in myth and reality. So there is, in fact, uh, you know, an accusation that uh, his methods of critiquing, his methods of analysis and interpretation are not, uh, you know, uh, structured enough. They are not clinically precise enough. So, you know, they say that he has... Uh, put down Western civilizations, Western mythology, or what we call Occidental mythology. And he has favored Oriental mythology over Occidental mythology. There's a lot of accusation against him. And you do have his defenders saying, no, no, the critics who actually criticize him are not broad-minded enough. So I thought, why not take such a writer? Now, let me make one thing very clear. When I discuss Marcha Eliade, 
I'm not going to follow a linear approach. I'm not going to go chapter by chapter as I told you. I'm going to talk about his views in a roundabout manner. Finally, at the end of the lecture, I'll sum up what he tries to tell us in myth and reality. So I will be starting off with examples. And from examples, I will build up on the concepts. OK? Now, these are some of the books of Machi Aliade. For your kind information, he was not just a historian of religion or a religious symbolist or a mythographer. He was also a fiction writer. He's written tales of the supernatural and the sacred, tales of the sacred and the profane. So you have a lot of his stories on the supernatural as well. So these are some of his books. And as I told you, you have a lot of books only on religion, myth, history, that is religious history. Okay, these are his books. In fact, some of his books are very difficult to get. Uh, some of them are available on the free domain. So if you can get a chance to download these books, do download them. Because these books are really worth a lifetime's reading. You will understand and perceive myth, religion, and symbolism from a very different viewpoint. So if you get a chance, please do download these books if they are available, freely available on the online domain. Now, immediately after showing you the works of Marcha Eliade, why am I bringing in Xenophates? It's with a reason. Because Marcha Eliade starts the first chapter of Myth and Reality with a reference to Xenophates. I want you to look at this particular citation very, very carefully. And I want you to look at these words that are highlighted in red through skepticism. Please note there's a change in the spelling. It's S-C, variantly you know, spelled as S-K. So skepticism and inquiry, meaning proper analysis, proper probing. We can approach a deeper understanding of reality. So how do you arrive at reality? According to Xenophants, how do you arrive at reality? You must be skeptical, meaning don't believe anything readily. So through skepticism and inquiry, through analysis and interpretation, you can arrive at an understanding of reality. So this is what Xenophants said. Let's move on to yet another quotation of Xenophants. Now, he says, if horses had hands or if lions had hands and if they were asked to draw the image of gods, they would draw them like horses. They would draw them like lions. So what does this indicate? What does this indicate? That we create gods when we use the faculty of imagination. We create gods in our own images. Usually, it's the other way around. Every mythology says that God created humans in his or her. Because these days, there's a lot of controversy on why do you, uh, you know, uh, uh, attribute a particular gender to God. So, if God made human beings in his or her own image, that is a different myth altogether. But he says, no, that's not the way you should be looking at myth. Myth makes gods, that is the so-called representations of gods and myths, according to Xenophanes, is anthropomorphic, anthros, meaning anything related to human beings, anthropomorphic, shaped like human beings. So the problem that most uh, philosophers, rationalists, and people of wisdom have regarding myth is that it projects gods as anthropomorphic, as having human qualities, jealousy, lust, anger, you know, trickster behavior, things like that. So Xenophanes and his contemporaries had problems regarding mythology. Xenophanes very clearly 
brought about a distinction between historia, that is history, and mythos. He said, historia is an account of facts. Mythos is just a bunch of lies. It is just a figment of our imagination. So with Xenophanes came the decline of myth. Earlier, myth had one connotation, denotation. One, it had to do with gods. It dealt with the narratives of gods. Okay, the narratives of myth dealt with gods and legendary figures. This was the original definition of myth. With Xenophanes, the you know definition changed. Xenophanes said, no, it's not going to be dealing with, uh, you know, supernatural beings. All that Homer and Hesiod and the others have written is just a bunch of lies. It's just a figment of your imagination. So it is nothing but, you know, imagination. It is not to be taken seriously. And you find that the same thing is reflected in Plato's Republic, book 10. He says, these prophets who rave and rant and who uh, predict a lot of things to come in future, these prophets and the poets who describe gods as anthropomorphic, these people through their words or through their writings feed and water the passions to quote Plato. So he says poetry, whether it comes, uh, you know, from the mouth of, uh, you know, a prophet or whether it comes from a poet. It feeds and waters the passions. It incites unnecessary feelings in people, in the readers, in the audience. So in his Republic, Book 10, he sided with Xenophanes in saying, people who write such stuff, people who speak such stuff, they should be driven out of the ideal Republic state. So this is what Xenophanes and Plato Lepon had to say. So the reason why we are bringing in Eliade is that we're bringing in Eliade because he goes against these people. He says what these people say is not true. Myth is of a different order altogether. It's of a different category altogether. Mercia Eliade has his own categorization. Okay, as I told you, I'm not going linear. So he has his own categorization and he follows the categorization that the native American Indians follow. One group of native American Indians called the Pawnee Indians follow this particular categorization. They classify myths into the sacred and the profane. Why profane? Why is that term used? Because when we talk about fairy tales and folk tales and fables, that is stories dealing with animals, we find that you have tricksters who indulge in all kinds of wily things, cunning things. So those are lower passions. So those myths which deal with lower passions are profane. They are not sacred. So what are the sacred myths? The sacred myths are cosmogonic myths, cosmos meaning the universe, myths dealing with the creation of the universe. So we call it cosmogenesis, the birth of the cosmos, the genesis or the birth of the cosmos. So cosmogonic myths, etiological myths, myths which explain why something exists, why something came to be. It need not be only good. It can also be myths explaining the origin of disease, the origin of evil, things like that. And of course, we have the eschatological myths. What are eschatological myths? Eschatological myths are those which deal with the end of the world. Okay. Now, every religion has the end of days. Hinduism talks about pralaya. Christianity and Islam talk about the day of the last judgment. In Islam, we call it Yom al-Qiyamah. So they say that Ashrafel blows his trumpet and then, of course, everything ends. God appears in the sky and you have to account for your good and bad. So eschatological myths are those that deal with the end of the world. 
every mythology, almost every mythology deals with the end of the world. And then of course you have the hero myths. They're also referred to as legends. Now, if you look at classical mythology, Greek and Roman mythology, you will find that most of the so-called legends are also part of the serious myths, the sacred myths. Do you know why? People have often asked me during workshops and uh, training programs, ma'am, how would you consider Ramayana? Is it a legend or is it a myth? I'll tell you why. Ramayana is a myth which is situated or which is set within the framework of a legend. Why? Number one, it follows some of the characteristics of a hero myth. At the same time, uh, you know, it is set within the larger myth, the sacred myth, because the hero is considered an avatar of God. Ram is considered one of the avatars of Lord Vishnu. So it is a sacred myth which follows the structure or the framework of a legend. The same applies to the myth of Hercules in Greek mythology. In Greek mythology, we say Hercules. In Roman mythology, we say Heracles. Now, if you look at the legend of Hercules, it reaches or it is elevated to the status of a sacred myth. Why? Because the origin of Hercules is divine. He is one of the sons of Zeus. So, Zeus took the form of Hercules' father and he went to Hercules' mother. He made love to his mother and that was how Hercules was born. The same with Perseus in Greek mythology. He is also considered one of the sons of Zeus. So he came to Danae in a shower of gold and that is how Perseus was conceived. So this is what we have to say. In most hero myths, we find that it reaches the status of a sacred myth because of the divine origins of the heroes. Even regarding the Pandavas, they all have divine origins, right? That is why the Mahabharata and the Ramayana are considered sacred texts. Because they deal with the supernatural and the heroes are not just of humble origin. They are seemingly of humble origin, of kings or of common people. But no, actually they are of divine origin. So this is something you need to know. So you have shaman myths. Now in many religions, you have the shamans. For example, the native Indians have the shamans. People who communicate between or who act as a link between human beings and gods. So you have the shamans. You have them in African mythology. You have them in the native Indian mythology. If uh, any of you has seen the film, The Poltergeist, part two, you have a native Indian who communicates with the spirits. So the shaman, the role of a shaman is very important in mythology. So you have shaman myths. How did they get powers from God? And what were the medicines that they were able to uh, bring from heaven or get from the gods and give to the human beings? Things like that. Okay. So all these come under the sacred. If you look at Hindu mythology, Indian mythology in general, the shamans are the rishis, okay, the sages, the siddhas and the sages come under the shamans because they act as intermediaries between ordinary human beings and gods. So that is what we call shaman myths, okay. And of course, in the Bible, we have the saints. We have the saints, we have the prophets, Okay, so in Christianity, the saints and the prophets, the apostles, they become the shamans. They take the role of the shamans. Now, I told you about the profane already. You have folk tales. They are mostly funny. You can narrate them anytime, anywhere. You have the fairy tales containing the supernatural elements. You have fables involving human beings and also animals. Animals who are anthropomorphic exhibiting human qualities apart from the power of speech. So all these are profane because they deal with lower passions or emotions. And you can narrate them anytime. Now, if you look at the Ramayana or the Mahabharata, you read them at a particular time. They sometimes say that you shouldn't read certain parts of the Mahabharata because you might have fights at home. 
There are certain beliefs associated with certain myths. And there are certain times of the month when you should read a particular part of the Ramayana. So that is why we consider them sacred. Now, we'll start off with the cosmogonic myths, okay? Now, one of the oldest world mythologies is the Babylonian mythology. Now, in most myths, you have common narratives, common units of narrative, meaning common incidents or events, which are repetitive in most myths. We call them my themes. Okay, M-Y-T-H-E-M-E-S. Claude Levi-Strauss talks about my themes in his book. Okay, so my theme, what is a my theme? It is a unit of narrative which is found in a particular myth or which is a recurrent feature in most myths. Now, one common my theme is that the world evolved from chaos. Okay, or the world arose from chaos or out of chaos. Now, according to Babylonian mythology, the salt waters, the chaotic salt waters were called Tiamat or Tayamat. Okay. And the sweet waters, this is how they call it, the sweet waters. Scholars call them the sweet waters. Okay. The sweet waters are personified as the god Absu. And the salt waters, the chaotic salt waters are personified as Tiamat. Now, it is a fact that waters from rivers, lakes, and ponds, they all flow into the sea. So look at the way in which poetically, this union of the waters from lakes, rivers, and the salt waters of the sea merge. So this union of the two types of waters gives rise to the gods. The gods are born out of this union of Absu and Tiamat. So the senior order of the gods. Okay, or the first order of the gods. But to Absu and Tiamat, they are the younger gods. And some of them are so rowdy, they're so loud, they drink and they make a lot of noise. See, anthropomorphism, like human beings. Very loud, very noisy, very aggressive. And Absu is disturbed. Because in the beginning, there was peace and quiet. See, the salt waters may be chaotic, but when they merged and when they brought forth the gods, the world gradually was evolving. You know, there was something happening in the world. Now, when there's so much of disturbance, Absu is very angry. He says, I'm going to destroy the young gods. I don't want any of them. We created them. We will destroy them. Tiamat, being the mother, is very angry. She does not think ahead. You know, she's very angry. And she decides that she must save her children. So she calls her eldest one, Ia. Okay, he's also called Enki, E-N-K-I. So she wants the elder one, the eldest one, Ia or Enki, look, your father's going to kill you. You better be careful. Ia thinks for a while and says, I will handle this. Leave it to me. Tiamat thinks that she will... He will either reform his ways or he will tell the gods to change or he will do something to convince his father. But things work otherwise. Ia gives Absu something to eat which makes him tipsy, drowsy and he goes off to sleep. When Absu is asleep, Enki or Ia kills his father. Tiamat is enraged. She never thought this would happen. She is now without a mate. She gets very angry and using the powers of chaos. Remember, she represents the salt waters of primordial, the original chaos. So using her powers, she brings forth 11 dragons or serpents or terrible creatures from the void, from chaos. And she decides to wage war against the gods. Okay, and she calls one of the gods who is on her side and gives him the tablet of rules. And she says, use this. 
This is for you. Whoever has that is the supreme ruler. So use this. You shall be the supreme ruler. Now, Ia's son, Marduk, is the one who comes to the rescue of the younger gods. They are not able to bear Tiamat's attack. Tiamat attacks ferociously. She's angry. She's lost her partner. She's very angry and she wrecks destruction. And along with her 11 you know, children from chaos, the dragons and serpents, she wrecks destruction. So Marduk decides to come to the rescue of the gods. He's the son of Enki and he fights against Tiamat. Now what you see here is the fight between Marduk and Tiamat. Tiamat is represented as a dragon, the mother dragon. Okay, so in the fight eventually, Marduk puts an end. He slays Tiamat. He slays Tiamat. He cuts her body into pieces. And from those pieces, the world is created. So this is about Tiamat and Marduk. So this is from Babylonian mythology. Okay, I'm telling you this with a purpose. I will come back to it. Now, here is a cosmogonic myth from Norse mythology. Again, in the beginning, there was chaos. Do you see the my theme that is common? Chaos. From chaos, you have someone coming out. Similarly, from chaos, okay, there's nothing but chaos. I believe, one, there is the world of fire, and two, there is the world of frost and ice. So you have two worlds and between the two worlds, there's nothing but darkness and chaos. Gradually, the two worlds come together. See, you have Absu and Tiamat coming together. The two different waters coming together. One is the salt water, the other is the good groundwater, the sweet water as it's called. Here, you have frost, you have ice. Two seemingly different concepts, two seemingly different contradictory elements coming together. So when frost and fire come together, the fire melts the frost and gradually the drops fall down. And from those drops comes the giant Amir. The giant Amir comes from the frost, from the drops of frost that fall to the ground. Okay, so what happens after that? Amir is one of those primordial giants who are destructive by nature. And when he is asleep, I believe from his legs and from under his armpits, there are more giants that are created. Okay, now when more of the frost melts, you have the cow, the divine cow, Udamla. Udamla comes out. And she licks the frost and brings out the first Azir, meaning the first primordial godlike figure called Buri. Now, Buri marries one of the giantesses, and through her, he has a son called Bor, B U R R, sometimes spelt as B O R R. Okay? Now, Bor once again marries a giantess and his sons are considered the primordial gods, the first of the gods, the Azir. The eldest one is Odin, the one-eyed god. And then you have Vili and Ve. Okay? Odin, as you see here, fights Emir and he kills him. And it is from Emir's body that the world is created. His blood becomes the waters, his uh, body and his muscles become the soil. So his hair becomes the plants. All that happens. So do you see the common my theme happening? Do you see that? It is only by destroying a primordial creature that the cosmogenesis takes place. The genesis or the birth of the universe takes place. So this is what happens in Norse mythology. Okay. So after Emir dies, you have the world being created. Now, all of us go by the scientific path. 
that the world is round or it is almost elliptical in shape. So here you have a woman on a turtle's back. Who is this woman? Now this is the myth of the Iroquois, the native Indians, a group of native Indians. According to them, you have sky man and sky woman who live in the sky world. Okay. Now sky woman is pregnant with twins. Hence the man is not happy about it. Now what happens is uh, they dig holes in the sky and I believe one hole gets too deep. And through that, sky woman is able to see the world below. Some say that she slipped and fell through that hole into the world below. Some say her husband got tired and pushed her. Okay, we don't know which is true. So she falls. The creatures of the ocean, there was no land then. There was only water. So the creatures of the ocean decide to help her and they all join together and they protect her from falling deep into the waters and drowning. So the sky woman, actually while falling, she clutches some of the soil from the sky world. Okay, she clutches some of the plants and the trees and their roots and their soil get stuck to her hands. She then tells the creatures, please find me something by which I can create something in this world. I'm pregnant with child. My children must have a world to live in. So all the creatures go in search of earth, in search of soil. No luck. Finally, the toad is very intelligent. Okay. We all look at the toad as a slimy, disgusting creature. No, not for them. The toad is the only one who emerges successful carrying a lump of clod in his mouth. She takes it from him. She rides on a huge monstrous turtle's back. She places that soil on the turtle's back and goes round and round. And because she is sky woman and has magical powers, that soil increases in length and in width. So when its mass increases, the world is created. So she puts her hands into that, you know, soil. And because her hands still have remains of the trees and all that, you have the trees coming out. The world is created. And whatever powder is remaining, she flings it upwards and the stars are created. So this is how the world is created. Now, the world on the turtle's back is flat. It's not round. Now, we all look at it to be dismissive as a bunch of lies, as, as children's stories, those of us who are pretty skeptical about myths. But let me tell you this. You have somebody who is much inspired by this. Do you see? The world on the turtle's back. Now, who is this writer? He is no more, God rest his soul in peace, Terry Pratchett. Terry Pratchett was one of the eminent writers on myth-making and on fantasy fiction. So his world is called Disc World. So how is the Disc World created? You have a tortoise or a turtle. On top of the turtle, there are four elephants. And on their back is the Disc World. So the Disc Flat. So he was much inspired by the myth of the native Indians and it is based on that that you have the disc world. So if you can read novels related to the disc world, you will find them extremely fascinating. He experiments a lot in mythology. So if you get a chance to read Terry Pratchett, please go ahead. So now do you understand how myth, uh, you know, Stephen Greenblatt talks about circulation and negotiation of meaning and values. So this is what happens here. Whatever starts off being a myth is passed on and it takes on different forms and different shapes. So see here, you have Terry Pratchett's, you know, Discworld, inspired by the native Indian myth.
All right. Now, I told you about three, uh, you know, myths dealing with creation, cosmogonic myths. Now, here is an etiological myth. Now, what is an etiological myth? It explains why something came to be. Every cosmogonic myth is also an etiological myth because it explains how the universe came to be, how the stars came to be, how the sun and the moon came to be, things like that. So here, this is about mortals who are metamorphized into different forms. Now, here is a story of Arachne. Now, Ariane in French means spider. Arachne was a very successful weaver. She was a young girl. She was a successful weaver. And, you know, she never prayed to any gods. She believed in her own efforts. Okay. Now, imagine those times when the gods reigned supreme, when they could come down to earth disguised in various forms and when they could talk to human beings, bless human beings, curse human beings. Those were the good old days. So, Athena is generally considered the goddess of the arts. Okay, she's the goddess of wisdom because she sprang from the head of Zeus and the head is supposed to be the seat of wisdom. And she's also the patron goddess of all the arts. So, she was enraged that Arachne was not willing to worship her. So, one day, she goes to her disguised as a crone, an old lady. And she says, oh, you spin so well, my dear. You spin so beautifully. Oh, I'm sure Edina has blessed you. Arachne, the typical proud pouting girl says, why should Edina bless me? It is my own efforts that bless me, that reward me. Why should I even think of Edina? Oh, is that so? Come on, let's have a fight. Let's have a competition. And the crone reveals herself to be Athena. Arachne is not, you know, uh, to be frightened by all this. She's not to be intimidated. She says, okay, let's start. So both of them set up the loom and they start weaving. Athena starts weaving. And in her tapestry, in her piece, she weaves the tapestry, the stories of gods punishing human beings for their mistakes. Indirectly telling Arachne, you better be careful. Don't mess up with me or don't mess around with me. Arachne, in turn, wove into her tapestry the stories of gods who ran after women, who were lusting after women. For example, Zeus, he changed himself into a bull and he carried away Europa. Zeus, who changed himself into a swan and he raped Leda. So it's about the gods, old and young, who ran after women. So she wove about the follies and foibles of the anthropomorphic gods. Arachne turned out to be the winner. Her loom was absolutely impeccable. It was beautiful beyond words. Athena couldn't stand this. This is Ovid's version in the Metamorphosis. This is Ovid's version. So she couldn't stand that. And she tore the loom and she beat. Arachne with her staff, with her spear and her staff. Arachne found it too humiliating. One, because she was the winner. She sought no help from Athena. She had not done anything to Athena except not worshipping her, according to her. So she was pretty angry about it. And she was pretty insulted. Feeling humiliated, she decided she would end her life. So she hanged herself. Athena's anger was not to be curbed so easily. She said, hang, hang for eternity. I'm not someone who's going to forgive you. Hang, hang for eternity. And stay there hanging and spinning and weaving. Hang. When she said this, Arachne's mortal form disappeared. She shrunk. She became a spider. And to date, Arachne spins. She cannot leave her spinning or weaving. She spins. She spins her web. So from Arachne, from the story of Arachne, we have the word arachnophobia, fear of spiders. So we call it etymological etiology. So where the origin of a word 
is attributed to a myth. So this is an etiological. Now, this is something from Norse mythology. I believe Odin and his brothers, Willy and Ve, they were walking along the seashore. They found two trees. Now, there's a lot of debate about the trees. Some say those were just pieces of wood that were drifting on the water. Some say there were two trees standing alone by the sea. Okay. Now, Odin and his brothers decided to bring life on earth. They call it Midgard. In Norse mythology, earth is called Midgard. So, they decided to bring life on earth. So, what did Odin and his brothers do? They transformed the trees into the first man and woman. So the man was Ask or Askar, A-S-K or A-S-K-R, and the woman was Embla. So you have the first man and woman, the primordial man and woman. Ask and Embla. So this explains how the first human beings were created. Okay, and for nature lovers, for those dealing with ecofeminism, eco criticism, and all that, this myth would be handy because it tells you how from trees life evolved. Okay, now let me not talk, I want you to read the comic. I created this comic from Storyboard that. So in case you people want to make use of narratives and things like that, you can always use storyboard that. So Odin gave them life. He gave them understanding. Willy, the second brother, the middle brother, gave them understanding. And the person who gave speech was Vey. Okay, he gave them a form, the mortal form. He gave them sight. He gave them the power to hear and he gave them the power to speak. So speech is attributed to faith. So this explains how human beings came to be. This explains how speech happened to be a human attribute. Okay. So this is an example of an ideological. Now, in Norse mythology again, you have a very powerful symbol. Okay, now you see here the snake biting its own tail. Now this snake in Norse mythology is called Yormagandr. Yormagandr is the gigantic serpent in Norse mythology. He is one of the children of Loki. I'm sure those of you who watch the film Avengers will know Loki. Okay, he's the trickster god in Norse mythology. So Loki had three children, Fenrir, Yormagandr and Hel, the goddess of the underworld. Okay, Fenrir is the giant wolf. Yormagandr is the giant serpent who circles earth and bites his own tail. His own tail is in his mouth. So when his tail is in his mouth, he does not attack earth or heaven as God. The land of the gods, Midgard. Okay, the land of the human beings or the underworld. The underworld, of course, consists of a lot of evil creatures. So he will not attack Asgard or Midgard when he bites his own tail. Now, this symbol is called Ouroboros. Ouroboros means the snake biting its own tail. It is related to the Shunya philosophy. It is related to the concept of infinity. And it is a very powerful symbol which suggests the eternal cycle of life and death, of birth and death. So this is a very powerful symbol. When you look at myth, don't look at myth per se. You must look at the symbols that it has and how they go about it. Remember one thing, when I told you about Tiamat, the salt waters, and it is from the salt waters the dragon who embodies the salt waters that the world is created. And finally, during the end of days, it will sink into the ocean. It will go back to chaos. What came from chaos will go back to chaos. So the cycle of birth and death. So this is what it is.
Mm. Now we come to the eschatological bits. Now what you see here is called Ragnarok. R-A-G-N-A-R-O-K. Ragnarok. Okay, what is Ragnarok? The end of days. Okay, what we call the day of last judgment. Pralaya, Yomal Kayama, call it what you will. In Norse mythology, it is Ragnarok. The end of days. Now, I told you, as long as Yormaganda, the gigantic serpent, bites his own tail, he will not attack heaven or earth. But the day he withdraws the tail from his mouth, he is ready to attack the world. So the person or the god, the Azir, who is going to fight against him is Thor, the god who wields the hammer. Okay, It is said that Thor will kill Yormagandar, but Yormagandar's venom will poison him and even before he takes nine steps, he will die. So it talks about not just the end of monsters, it talks about the end of the gods as well. Okay? And you know, uh, Fenrir will also, you know, fight with the gods and he will kill the god who fights with him. But Vidar, one of the gods, will stamp his jaw, which is called Fenris, and tear him up to his tail and kill him. But in doing so, Odin is the god who will kill him, who will fight and be destroyed by him, but Vidar will kill him. So I believe finally all the gods, all the monsters will die and there will be fire that will set, be set ablaze. The whole world will be reduced to ashes and it will drown in the ocean. And a new order will begin to surface. So a new world order is created. You will not have the same old gods again. You will have not have the same old monsters. Nothing. A new world order will be created. So when we talk about the flooding, when we talk about the sea, the deluge and all that, we talk about pralaya, we talk about the deluge. It does not mean that everything has come to an end. It is not an end. Death here, destruction here is not the end. It is the beginning of a new world order. So the return of divinity, the return of a new world order. Now, why did I leave it blank here? Because I thought I'm tired of having writings there. So I thought I'll narrate it. This is Zoroastrianism, the end of days. The person with a human-like appearance is Ahura Master or Ormazd. The embodiment of good, the godly power that represents good. And Angramanyu or Ariman, the bestial figure who represents evil. So finally, it all boils to this, the battle between the forces of good and the battle between the forces of evil. So this is a common my theme. So eschatological myths. And mind you, in Zoroastrianism, this is a different uh, version altogether. They say that when God and the Savior together defeat Ariman and his evil forces, hell itself will be destroyed and everybody on earth, you know, everything will be destroyed. And I believe the sacred fire, Zoroastrianism considers fire sacred. The sacred fire shall make everything pure and good. And I believe all human beings will attain the status of divinity. Now look at this. It's a completely different world order. Everybody will become good. All of them will become divine. So there will be no such thing as evil in the world. This is Zoroastrianism. So I told you about cosmogonic myths. I told you about etiological myths. I told you about eschatological myths. Here you have the hero myths. You have Hercules fighting the Hydra. This is one of his 12 labors or 12 tasks that he has to do. Fighting the, you know, Hydra of Learn. Here is another example from classical mythology. That is Medusa, the Gorgon. And the person who closes his eyes and kills her with his sword is Perseus the son of Zeus and Danae. So this is one of the tasks that a king sets for him. 
there. He uses a head to defeat his enemies. Okay, because whoever looks at her head is turned into stone. That is the curse that she has. So again, another hero myth, the myth of Perseus and Medusa, the Gorgon. Of course, welcome back to Indian mythology. This is just a clipping from Adi Purush. So here you have the battle between Ram and Ravan. So as I told you, a sacred myth which is within the framework of a legend. And here you have, why should we always talk about men being heroes? Here is Mulan. Who are Mulan? is considered a legendary female warrior in China. A girl who signed up instead of her father, disguised as a man, and who fought for China against the enemy. There are many scholars who repudiate or who question the validity of this particular legendary character, but many other scholars say no, Hua Mulan that did exist in China. So I told you about hero myths, you have so many people call, like Sushumna and so many others who were great physicians. You have the Saptarishis who were able to cure. Agastya was supposed to have curing powers. Vishwamitra was supposed to have curing powers. Vasishta. There are so many legends about the Rishis, the Siddhas, who had curing powers, curative powers. So this is about the shamans. In Indian myths and legends, these are the shamans. In Kerala myths and legends, you have Alatur Nambi. The profane myths, the cocktails, the hare and the tortoise, the Panchatantra stories, the Hitobadesha, the Jataka tales. All these are examples of the profane. You can narrate them anytime, anywhere. Not the case of the sacred myths. Now, I've given you his classification. Now let's go on to some important lines. Now, according to Marcha Eliade, myth is a sacred history. Now, these are opinions which you can debate upon. You can say, I disagree with Marcha Eliade. That is up to you. So now I'm going to tell you how you should interpret Eliade in the modern trend. Okay, in terms of modern myth making, revisionist free writing of myths, revisionist mythopoesis or mythopoeia, how do you go about understanding Marcha Eliade? Now, myth narrates a sacred history, it says. Okay, so myth is sacred. So, Eliade completely rules out folk tales, fairy tales, fables, whatever. No. So, we are here talking only about those myths involving gods and national heroes who protect the nation, like Mulan. So the myth narrates a sacred history. It relates an event which took place in primordial time, not the historical time, time which is sacred and superior to historical time. Primordial time, the ancient time, what Australian mythology calls, the aboriginal mythology calls dream time. Because it exists in our subconscious. So as far as we are conscious, we think only in terms of historical time. So primordial time, the fable time of the beginnings. So we, he talks about myth in terms of cosmogenesis, the beginning of the universe, how it is. And I want you to look at the second citation. Now here, what do you understand? If you look at Eliade, he always exalts the myth of creation. He says any myth tells you how something came to be. So every myth is a creation myth. Every sacred myth is a creation. See, if you look at Campbell, if you look at Jung, if you look at, uh, you know, various others like Katsira, if you look at Elwood, you have each one, uh, you know, talking about a different type of myth. But for Eliade, it's always a creation myth that stands supreme. So this is something you should understand with regard to Eliade. For him, every myth, every sacred myth of the gods is a creation. Okay? And here, the actors are supernatural beings, meaning the gods. 
and even if it's a hero the hero is a demigod meaning ha is of divine origin like perseus like ram like krishna now i want you to take a look at this only when the supernatural elements make an entry into this world does something happen in this world it is their breakthrough it is their entry that is responsible for everything that is happening in this world divine intervention one of the characteristics of any epic is divine intervention when there is some important action climactic action taking place what is the main characteristic divine intervention so it is because of the divine intervention of the gods the supernatural actors in the drama of creation that everything takes place so it is because of the gods according to eliade it is because of the gods that man is a mortal or human being are mortals sexed into male and female it is because of the gods that human beings are cultural beings now what exactly does he mean by this let me look at the next one and i'll explain it to you now this is about the structure and the function of the myths now what are the can functions of myth what is the structure of the myth so he calls it religious history okay that is why he is not called a mythographer in those days they refer to him as a religious historian okay so you have myth being the history of the acts of the supernatural so it is religious history as differentiated from the history of normal human beings the plebeians now why is it true because it is concerned with realities so here eliade refuses to believe that myth can be a figment of imagination no it is concerned with realities whatever happened if you say ram kill ravan it is reality if you do say that zeus created the world according to the greeks yes it is reality and it is sacred because any myth which concerns human i mean the divine pantheon the divine order of gods is supernatural sacred and look at this so whenever you are dealing with any myth of creation whenever you are dealing with any etiological myths remember you can bring in eliade you can quote eliade and you can also mention where you differ from eliade see when you do analysis and interpretation this is very important you know you must find out where you can agree with eliade where you can disagree that is very important you don't have to always agree with a great critic you may have a completely different set of opinions so he says always sacred myths are creation myths etiological myths and myths constitute the paradigms for all significant rituals in our lives for example even today when you have an upanayana for a child the poonul as they call it when there is an upanayana what are the rituals followed what is the significance of those rituals if you look at the mahabharat you have the rajasuya yagna performed the ashwamedha yagna or the rajasuya yagna performed in prehistoric time okay because the mahabharat is still considered part of historic time they say that kurukshetra did exist in haryana and there was a battle fought but we don't know whether the pandavas mentioned in the mahabharat and the kauravas you know with the eldest as duryodhan we don't know if they were the characters involved and we don't know if in history lord krishna gave arjuna the gita upadesha in the middle of the battlefield we don't know about that we don't know whether these characters from mythology did exist in historical time we don't know about that but whenever we look at any ritual for example the ashwamedha yagna or the rajasuya yagna in prehistoric time i believe it was conducted only once the king would raise his staff and pound it to the ground and he would hold his hands up saying i hold heavens and earth for you meaning i am an intermediary between earth and heaven between my people and god so every ritual has a reenactment of the original drama so when you know you have marriages most hindu marriages have the kashi yatra 
why it is an enactment of a ritual you are reenacting the drama that was enacted first in primordial time so myths form a pattern for you to carry out your daily activities now by knowing myths by knowing the origins of things you can control and manipulate them so that is very important okay and the knowledge that one experiences meaning either by learning about these myths by enacting those myths for example you have dance dramas you have sacred dance dramas which are enacted during certain days during days of the dashara you have sacred dramas enacted and people who enact those plays are supposed to follow certain rules and regulations they can't consume alcohol they can't take non vegetarian food they're supposed to follow certain rules and regulations why because when you enact the role of a divine uh, you know being you have become that being you live the myth then so that is what has to be done and remember one thing he talks about having memory of the past meaning of myths of legends of everything he says that is a virtue to know so much about mythology is a virtue you know and people who are perfect have no need to remember because it's all here for them so all that is part of the primordial memory the ancient subconscious memory this is what jung also says the existence of the archetype in the subconscious mind in the unconscious and the subconscious mind this is what carl gustav jung talks about so you have the primordial archetypal memory the subconscious memory which talks about archetypes they are there in your subconscious these are ancient and then you have the historical and the personal events which you see every day so people who are blessed like the poets like homer virgil uh, you know hesiod people like these poets like these vas vyasa valmiki people like these who are blessed by god these people can reenact the myths these people can reproduce the myths for us and they can take us to that world and people who relive those myths now look people who have memory of former lives don't think it talks about reincarnation in the physical sense as we see in most films where there the, the person comes back again no no that's not what eliad is talking about when you say the memory of former lives meaning when you read the past you fit yourselves into the shoes of that particular character you look at things from that character's point of view so in doing so you're reliving those lives again you are reliving many lives you are incarnating metaphorically so this is what you're doing so as i told you there are two types of people people who are blessed and who talk about the gods like homer and hesiod and uh, vyasa and uh, you know so many others so these are the people who are inspired by the muses who are almost prophetic in talking about the gods who are recovering our memory who talk to us about what happened in the beginning of time and those who read more about the past who learn more about the past they learn about the mythical time they imagine themselves from that point of view when a war when they read about wars being fought they imagine themselves as those warriors fighting those battles so these are like reincarnations they are living different lives they understand their previous lives meaning they understand the past history of mankind that is what eliad is trying to say okay and finally towards the end he talks about how while reading okay while reading or while listening to a particular myth or a story you are transported to that particular era you are transported to that particular moment so you can overcome the barrier of time 
So we talk about time as linear, past, present, and future. He says, no, it's a flux. It is liquid. It is dynamic. It is susceptible to change. So it is trans-historical, meaning it cannot be confined or garrisoned within the limits of history. No, you can't do that. So when you read something, when you read, uh, you know, the myth of Aeneas, or when you read Dante's Alighieri's Inferno or Paradise or Purgatrio, when you read the Odyssey or the Iliad or Hesiod's Theogony, when you read the Valmiki Ramayana or the Kambas Ramayana, when you read the Adbuta Ramayana, the Hanuman Charitra, whatever be it, when you read all this, why when you read, you know, the, the biblical rendering of Noah's Ark and how God drowned the rest of the world in a deluge and how a new world order was created, you kind of get transported to that realm. So that is what is important. So you escape from the confines of the physical realm and mentally you're transported to a different realm. There, time has a different definition Now, now, well, now that I've come to almost the end of everything, I'm just giving you an example on interpretation. I want you to look at how you can see Eliade's interpretation. Now, this is a retelling of the Mahabharata by Chitra Banerjee Devakaruni, The Palace of Illusions. Now, the Pandavas marry Draupadi, or Arjuna marries Draupadi, and, you know, she says, share whatever you've brought. And she's forced to marry the Panchapandas, not just Arjuna, but the remaining four as well. And in Divakaruni's feminist narrative, you have Kunti giving her brinjal's eggplant and asking her to cook, to make brinjal curry. Now, she's shocked. She's not used to it. Now, remember, in Divakaruni's narrative, Draupadi was trained by a sorceress on how to manage even in the most difficult of circumstances, how she could place her hand, you know, her, her head on her hand and go to sleep without waiting for a pillow, how even the ground can be a luxurious bed for her if she puts her mind to it, things like that. So I want you to look at this. Now, to sum up this particular incident, at first Draupadi, you know, is not able to manage. The smoke gets into her eyes and, you know, she almost ends up smoking the brinjal. And, uh, you know, you're burning the brinjal. Kunti said her voice kind. Also, you've put in too much salt. Oh, look how red your eyes are. I should have guessed that a princess like you brought up in luxury, wouldn't have any experience with cooking. <sighs> go, 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 scrub the pots. I'll take care of the curry. So, let me get to the end of it. Draupadi is now ready. She says, respected mother, uh, being younger than you, I know that I'm not as good a cook as you are. Please let me relieve you of your burden. You've been cooking for these people all these days. Please let me cook this time. If your sons are displeased, I'll accept the blame. I'll take the blame. So what does she do? She sends a prayer to the fire god, Agni. Okay. So she prays to Agni to hold back his power. She imagines a coating of spices on the brinjal. Okay, she imagines and with that imagination, she conjures a rich dish of brinjal curry. And she doesn't open her eyes until the smell, the aroma of the spices fills her nostrils. So she applies what her teacher had taught. Okay, now. See, her son's. Praise the brinjal for the distinctive taste. They ask for more. And Draupadi keeps quiet in the kitchen and she allows Kunti to serve her son. Uh, look at the last sentence. I kept my face carefully impassive, my eyes on the floor, but she and I both knew that I had won the first round. So it's almost like a round of fight. So the typical mother-in-law, daughter-in-law conflict, which you find in most literature. Now, 
if you look at it from Eliade's perspective, it is the female enactment of the king passing on his authority to his son. So the mother-in-law passing on the line of authority to the daughter-in-law. So the myth being enacted, the original drama being enacted. So when Kunti passes on the line of authority to Draupadi, it comes with a test. Now you have its parallel in classical mythology. For example, Cupid, the god of love, when he brings Psyche, his mother Aphrodite, Gives her a series of tests. She is not pleased with her daughter-in-law. She gives her a series of tests. But with divine intervention, Psyche passes the tests. So you have my themes. You have common narratives, mythical narratives from world mythology. This is what you should do. So what are the common my themes that you find? What are the ritual practices that are brought here into play? How does myth shape ritual? So here, divine intervention. And with divine intervention, the feminist narrative says with divine intervention, Draupadi was able to pass the test. So you may say, oh, no, no, this is the woman's rendering of the narrative. No, look at it from Eliade's perspective. She, Diva Karuni is only telling you that this is an enactment of the primordial drama. So this is what it is. So I hope I have done justice to Eliade, I have done justice to the idea of myth and myth making. So, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. It's a pleasure to talk on this topic. I'm bringing out a book in the near future on myth and myth making. I shall let you know about this when my book is published. Thank you once again for the opportunity. I'm indeed indebted for the opportunity given to me.